Hello, everyone. This is Stacy Factor from Bath. I'd like to welcome you to our Asia Friendly Time Zone webinar. I'd like to say good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. So let's go together on the path of paperless trade. Um, I want to say a special thanks to our co host and sponsor, R3, for helping to make this happen. But we have a bit of housekeeping to go through uh, before I turn it over to our moderator. Uh, just be sure that on the screen you'll see that there is a housekeeping slide for uh, Q&A. Please type into the Q&A box that um, is showed on the screen in the, with the green arrow. So that's, that's when you are um, trying to ask questions to the speakers. Most speakers will speak for um, a period of time, and then there will be a Q&A at the end of each of their sessions. Um, and also, there is a chat box there that you can use for um, having conversations with each other. So I am very, very, very pleased to introduce a friend and colleague and um, from R3, Henry Rojas, who's the head of trade finance at R3, responsible for business development, partnerships, and strategy for trade finance. Henry works with banks, corporates, and technology partners to design and commercialize trade solutions on Corda, which is R3's enterprise blockchain platform. Over to you, Henry. Thank you, Stacy, And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, so I'm delighted to join Bath and my uh, esteemed panelists for today's webinar. Um, maybe just uh, to, just to set some context before we go into the, the presentations. Uh, today's session is, is special in that we're joined by some of the leading voices in uh, in the digitization for trade in Asia, and each with their own unique perspective from a government, industry body, and technology firm. Um, you know at uh, there's been a greater urgency recently and uh, focus on digital, uh, digital trade uh, given the current environment. And within Asia and more specifically ASEAN, um, there's been a, a concerted effort to fostering regional connectivity and stronger economic integration. Um, at R3, we've played our role in helping enable, enable this digitization of trade, the promotion of standards to enable interoperability across these platforms. And today we to date we have over a hundred financial institutions and thousands of corporates using Corda for trade and supply chain financing, processing over a billion dollars worth of value. Um, and, and in our conversations with a lot of the, the companies that we work with, and oftentimes they they'll ask, you know, what what role can the governments play or industry bodies play in enabling digital trade? Uh, what are the, the key initiatives that they should be aware of and how do they ensure that the solutions that you know they're building are interoperable uh, with future platforms uh, and so with that you know to help answer these questions we've brought together um, a great group of panelists to to share more about the work they're doing to enable that um, so our first panelist uh, is, is Sin Young Lo, who's Director of Trade at the Infocom Media Development Authority in Singapore. And um, he, he can share a little bit about you know, what the Singapore government is doing to help promote paperless trade uh, in Singapore and um, across the globe. So with that, I will pass the uh, floor to Sin Young. Uh, thank you, Henry. Uh, hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to actually um, share our work uh, with a global audience. So uh, basically, this is the outline of my presentation today. Um, just briefly, um, I'm the director for trade under sectoral transformation group in Singapore's uh, Infocom Media Development Authority, IMDA for short. My role is to look at what and how technologies can be effectively used in contributing towards the digitalization effort. 
of the Singapore wholesale trade sector. So I, I actually work with a private organization in the trade logistic, transportation, and trade finance industries to promote the adoption of ICT technologies to enhance their competitive advantage in the global market. So IMDA is actually a statutory board in the Singapore government under the Ministry of Communication and Information. As a regulatory body, we oversee and implement policies related to ICT, media and poster industries in Singapore. We also run the personal data protection from off, as well as the prevention of online falsehood and manipulation office. In addition to our government role, IMDA is also responsible for driving Singapore's digital transformation through the use of ICM technology. We work closely with private organizations in various sectors for this. COVID-19 has brought about unprecedented impact to the global and local economy to meet business continuity and daily life needs through this challenge period. We have seen a wider embrace for e-commerce and digital tools among businesses and citizens. This shift in mindset and behavior presents an opportunity to drive more widespread and deeper digitalization amongst individuals and businesses. In trade, these are just some of the top of the mind concerns of businesses around the world and all are looking to governments to take action. <clears throat> in Singapore, we adopt a whole of government approach in all our trade digitalization efforts. MTI and IMDA are not alone in Singapore trade digitalization efforts. Whole government within a single jurisdiction is not sufficient, in our view. The impact that this new virus has created globally further amplifies the extent of interconnectedness of our societies today. Just like how our best scientists are collaborating closely on COVID-19 preventive measures and cures, we need to do the same when it comes to electronic commerce and trade, because ultimately, trade has no has no geographical boundary. As such, it is now even more important for international forums, such as the one we are having now, to maintain and promote multilateral dialogues to discuss and exchange views on topics that are of mutual interest at various levels, such as policies, technologies, legal frameworks, and standardization for the benefit of our people. Our national single window that we put in place since 1989 had contributed significantly to our economy over the past 30 years. Together with Electronic Transaction Act that was introduced in 1998, an amendment to align with UNCITRA's MLEC in 2010, this was estimated, it was estimated that more than 99% of trade and business documents are now exchanged digitally within Singapore, both for business to business, as well as business to government transactions. But a key challenge remains. How do we enable cross-border transaction and exchange of trade documents? Digitally, of course. In addition to G2G connectivity, we need a better way that is cheap fast and easy for thousands of digital silos globally to interoperate. We do this by focusing on the two key factors that resisted digitalization since the invention of electronic networks that allow organizations to exchange business documents electronically. They are inefficient processes and fragmented systems. And when we say fragmented system, it can be electronic or manual systems. International supply chain today typically involve many parties with sets of documents 
that are handed over from one actor to another along the value chain. To cater for the different degree of digitalization or digital readiness of each of these sectors, we need to interoperate not only with digital system, but also to interoperate between human and machine and between hard copy and digital documents. From the past experience of our involvement in numerous trade digitalization projects, we have learned that the solution to cross-border paperless trade is not only a technical one. The solution needs to be an embodiment of business needs, standardization, law and technology. The set of software components and tools that we build is just a manifestation of this embodiment. Trade Trust is designed for organizations to easily integrate and deploy onto their existing IT infrastructure while extending interoperability beyond one's respective digital community. We started looking at the various um, numerous proof of concept out there in the market when we started uh, this project two years ago. And we have distilled our key learnings into these five key design principles that we believe is the key to interoperability across digital ecosystems. Blockchain is designed for decentralization. As such, we want to leverage on this unique attribute for cross-border trade, which is how businesses trade with one another. Because we use a public blockchain, it is then a must that we keep all data off-chain. Even the slightest, slightest metadata that allow anyone to infer intelligence will not work. As our focus is on document level, we do not prescribe how the document within the trade trust file should be formatted or what data should be in there. This is also to cater, to leg for, cater for legacy systems where data is exchanged using traditional EDI formats or standards. To facilitate adoption, we are licensing trade trust under open source. And last but not least, we want to allow electronic document or title to be issued and transacted in a peer-to-peer -peer manner across different platforms. We believe MLETR compliant will be the enabler and game changer in paperless trade. Trade trust is not just for Singapore. Over the past two years, uh, we have been working closely with international organizations by contributing what we had built to the global community. We see this as a public good that government should invest that will enhance our businesses' ability to generate and capture value. This is how trade trust look like from the technical perspective. Its modular design will ensure minimum coupling and provide us the flexibility to cater for changes in, in technology for the future. We have since completed version 3 of the prototype and had demonstrated successfully its ability to transfer ownership of an electronic transferable record or electronic document or title between counterparties in Singapore and Rotterdam over a public Ethereum blockchain network. For the very first time, we are able to create an electronic title document in one platform and allow it to be transacted in a peer-to-peer -peer manner across different platforms throughout its life cycle. This is uh, just an illustration of uh, how we make use of public um, Ethereum network to actually capture all the um, fingerprint of the document that are exchanged by different party with different um, digital readiness and digitalization level. So in this slide, you can see that there are three bubbles on left, center, and the right. The left actually represent a um, a closed blockchain network 
that you can see uh, many in the market today. The center bubble signifies a non-blockchain bank platform, um, which could be considered as a legacy system today. And last but not least, on the right hand side, you see this is a government system. We we actually illustrate um, how a in an invoice generated in one um, digital ecosystem can be processed and validated at the other two digital ecosystems. Trade digitalization is a truly global effect, spanning across authorities, associations, and businesses. Since its inception two years ago, our approach to solving the paperless trade problem had garnered interest from many parts of the world. In January this year at Davos, uh, which is a World Economic Forum event, a multilateral MOI was in, comprises multinationals from both the East and the West to further our effort in digitalizing trade. Our work is currently published under out open source license at GitHub. We encourage any interested party to explore and make use of it if it's of value to you. We are now reaching out to the global community to walk the journey with us. Uh, this is all I have for today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sinyang, for that. Um, so, so hopefully, um, uh, the audience that you had a chance to, to understand what, you know, what Singapore is doing both in country and internationally to help uh, facilitate global trade and interoperability both you know b2b and b2g um i guess moving to the next topic we, we also wanted to you know hear you know what other countries are doing um you know in this paperless trade effort and you know, with that, I'm, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Kopsak, uh, who is Secretary General for the Thai Bankers Association. Uh, Kopsak is also um, part of the ASEAN Business Advisory Council. Uh, and uh, he'll share a little bit about what Thailand is doing uh, to help facilitate paperless trade. Uh, so with that, I will pass the time to Kun Kopsak. morning thank you Henry and uh, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to speak today as int introduction uh, in addition to the be the secretary general of the Thai Banker Association I'm also representing Thailand in APEC Business Advisory Council and ASEAN Business Advisory Council uh, in Digital economy, the new normal and new lifestyle at the post-COVID, digital transformation will become part of our life and it's moving faster. Regional digital trade transformation from the paper-based and manually key in transaction to paperless digital transaction is a project that would help increase efficiency, reduce cost. Okay. Currently, there are several initiatives on digital platform related to international trade, both promoted by the various governments and corporates, such as the NTP of Singapore, the Trade Walls of Japan, the E-Trade Connect of Hong Kong, U-Trade Hub of Korea, and National Digital Trade Platform of Thailand, Third Lens, and others. There are several benefits and advantages of digital trade platform, including faster cost reduction, online processes, efficiency, transparency, and chair infrastructure.
in addition the digital threat transformation would be a positive factor for ease of doing business rating of the country the national digital trade platform of thailand which was initiated about one and a half years ago is to increase efficiency and re and reducing cost in international trade business and to increase competitiveness of the of the country it would connect related related parties in international trade transactions including importers and exporters liners trade providers banks insurance company through digital and with the government agency through the national single window platform on september 19 2019 the national digital trade platform or ntp received a support and endorsement from the thai government it would help also help address several pain points for importer and exporters and other related parties in international trade transactions such as the double financing documents for banks that would also be for domestic trade transaction in the future there are two tracks that should be done parallelly on regional digital trade transformation and connectivity one at the national level country would have to transform processes and operations for all related parties both private and government to digital and to have it connect end to end at the regional level where we would connect with digital trade platform of other countries or companies and or and or related business platform digitally next on the regional level we should work on standard standard guidelines for off harmonized rules and regulations and documentations digital platform interoperability get getting policy support from regional government and getting regional co cooperation getting support from all related parties and knowledge sharing and capacity building this is slide show also show pilot project of ntp in thailand at present epic business advisory council and ASEAN Business Advisory Council are both promoting the regional digital trade connectivity. The APEC Business Advisory Council has, has a project called the APFF Digital Trade Lab to accelerate digitization of trade and supply chain finance and to provide voluntary platforms to support ongoing initiative. This project was endorsed by the APEC Finance Minister on October 2019. APEC, ASEAN BAC, including Digital Trade Connect, a project name of Regional Digital Trade Connectivity in its recommendations to ASEAN leaders and ASEAN economic ministers. And the East Initiative was included in the 2019 ASEAN leaders share statement in November 2019. ASEAN BAC has established the focal point group from 10 ASEAN BAC countries to work with the consultants supported by the UK government and the Japanese government to do the study and provide recommendation on standard guidelines of harmonized rule and regulations and digital platform interoperability. As we all agree, the digital transformation has been accelerated by COVID-19. This initi the initiative of regional digital trade transformation or paperless trade initiative has come in the right time. It would play an important role on businesses and prosperity of the country and the, re and the region in future. Blockchain would be an important part that would create a trust in, in the digital transaction. Therefore, I would like to encourage that we work closely together, broad private sector and the government sector, to speed up a transformation of our trade transaction from the paper based and manually rekey in of the data to digital process and paperless end to end. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kun Gopsa. Um, this is very interesting and hopefully gives you a sense of uh, you know, what some of the countries are doing, you know, both with, uh, lo locally as well as internationally. Um, I guess for the next presentation, what we wanted to showcase was more from the technology point of view, you know, what companies are doing uh, to help facilitate the both public and private sector initiatives. Um, and so with that, I will pass the time to Boone, who is uh, Director for Product Development at the Cargo Club. So uh, Boone, over to you. Thank you, Harry. Henry, uh, for introducing me. Um, <clears throat> I'm honored to be here. So um, good morning, uh, fellow speakers, um, organizers, and uh, audience. Right. So today's uh, my topic is about um, paper, uh, to moving towards paperless trade using blockchain and what uh, my company, um, VCargo Cloud, um, has been doing uh, uh, to move this um, uh, initiative. So. So um, we, we, we know that um, trade uh, happens every day and a lot of trade is going on even during this COVID period, right? That's how the goods, uh, electronic goods from China comes to our shopping centers and how a um, uh, chili crab sauce from Singapore ends up in London, for example, right? So uh, a lot of, um, but what you may not know is that a lot of documents are generated um, upon the signing of a sales contract, right? So when a buyer agrees to buy something from a seller, a whole chain of events happen, right? If you look at the uh, this slide here, it sort of uh, encapsulates the number of documents and the number of parties needed in order for the good to, to travel from one country, the exporting country, to the importing country, right? So, um, and... And the whole supply chain is actually sort of linked by all these paper documents, right? Um, and it, Ayata has uh, reported that an air cargo shipment can generate as much up to paper 30 documents for one shipment. And each year, more than 7,800 tons of paper documents are processed, right? And they can fill up to a 80 Boeing um, jetliner, okay? But what, what is the problem with all this uh, paper? Basically, right, um, first of all, uh, fraud, right? So um, as uh, Kun Kopsak has uh, stated, uh, fraud is quite prevalent in the um, trade finance, right? And, and looking at the number of, uh, looking at the, the uh, amount, right, uh, that is being financed, so up to $9, nine trillion, right, is uh, of world trade is financed by some sort of uh, credit guarantee or insurance. And, and because of paper, it is highly um, successful to, uh, to uh, fraudulent um, changing of numbers, changing of the um, things on the paper to be presented. Okay, so that's one. The second problem, is that uh, it's prone to error, right? Because we have several documents that needs to be data entered into various systems. So one mistake by a um, data entry clerk may cause a lot of mistakes down the uh, supply chain, okay? And third is inefficiency. So um, this, is, uh, this has to be tackled uh, by the government side, uh, as Mr. Sinyong has mentioned, there's a lot of inefficiencies when you process a lot of paper. And what happened is that um, when to do an export or to do an import, uh, there's a lot of departments or government departments involved processing multiple copies of papers being handed again and again to each department. So there's a lot of man hours lost uh, and costs involved. With that, um, therefore, digitization is absolutely necessary. And that's why we are here to talk about the paperless journey, right? Okay, so what does the digitization of trade documents bring? So first of all, is that um, we can obtain data from source, okay? 
So for those in the know, data from source is usually the most reliable data, right? So if I am the seller and I invoice and I send my invoice to somebody, he can be trusted that the data from me, right? Unless I purposely want to cheat him, will be will be um will be the real real thing, right? The figures are real, right? Um so with data from source, there's there'll be more trust within the uh, supply chain. Okay. Next is that uh, because of digitization, we can prevent uh, fraud. It's easier to prevent fraud because uh, supporting documents that banks need, such as the bill of lading, the customs permit, sort of origin, etc., can be obtained from the source, right? And therefore, these data can be trusted uh, to help prevent uh, fraud during the, uh, let's say, uh, processing of the trade finance. And third is that. Um, with digitized data and with cleaner data, um, eventually governments will be obtaining um, improved uh, trade compliance information, and therefore they are able to produce better trade statistics, right? Because uh, the data has been sanitized, has been checked uh, digitally uh, by the system. Lastly, uh, for the traders ourselves, uh, basically this will improve efficiency and uh, introduce cost reduction, right? Because um, there's no need to submit multiple copies to multiple agencies anymore. Okay. Okay, but there's a little bit of problem here with uh, cross-border trade, right? Um, if you look at this, uh, assuming that the trade is moving from the left of this slide to the right, uh, and, and the world is, and the countries are divided by either the ocean or the border boundary, there's actually a limit of control and trust uh, within each country, right? So in, in a way, it's very hard to, for, for us to trust another company that's in another country because we, the jurisdiction doesn't reach there or it's very hard for me to know who, is, who am I dealing with, right? Um, therefore, there's actually a need to extend trust across the border, right? And, and, the, uh, and the next slide, I will show how the governments in, uh, in ASEAN are trying to do that, trying to bridge the trust between two countries. Okay, so first of all, the government of ASEAN has come up with the um, concept of an ASEAN single window. Okay, so this has gone live um, end of last year, uh, 2019. So by end of last year, all government um, in ASEAN can exchange the certificate of origin. This is uh, what we call the ATIGA from the ASEAN Trade in Goods Agreement. Uh, it is a free trade agreement for ASEAN. And with, with the ASEAN single window uh, connected to all the single windows in ASEAN, each customs can exchange the preferential set of origin with each other electronically. Okay. Let me just give you an illustration of how it works. So for example, um, I'm talking about Cambodia export to Singapore, right? Uh, because VCC, we, uh, we built, uh, we helped the Cambodia government build the Cambodia single window. And uh, I know this process quite well. Okay. So basically the exporter in Cambodia will apply for a CO with a, with a preferential CO uh, with the Ministry of Commerce in Cambodia. Once the um, CO is approved, an electronic copy will be sent to the Cambodian National Single Window, right? And after that, the Cambodian National Single Window will forward this electronic copy to the Singapore National Single Window and the NTP, right? Meanwhile, the, and of course the NTP uh, is um, uh, hosted by the customs, so customs will receive it. And when the goods, with the physical goods travel from Cambodia, all the way to Singapore, right? What happens is that the trader need not attach a paper, a paper CO anymore, right? Because customs already has an electronic copy. So this allows a paperless clearance, at, at least for CO at customs. And the good thing is that when customs clear this particular cargo, the utilization report is generated, basically telling the um, exporter that, hey, your CO has been utilized by, by the importer in my country, 
right? And, and this uh, utilization report goes to a single window back to Cambodia and, um, and is distributed to both the Ministry of Commerce and the Cambodia Customs. So you can see that with, with uh, this is how the digitization of a CO is working, right? In, in uh, ASEAN context. Now, um, basically the advantages are, right, uh, I've stated here, uh, establish trust and prevent fraud because the single windows, the ASEAN single window is a G2G uh, mechanics. Therefore, anything sent by the other government to, to, to Singapore government or vice versa can be trusted, right? So the trust is established using that, this uh, ASEAN single window. Um, and also is a step towards paperless trade uh, and the exporting country and importing country have the ability to get the documents in real time, whether it's a CO or a utilization report, right? So any kind of statistics will be much faster. Now, um, uh, this is how it works, right? Basically, uh, each country has to install a, a ASEAN single window gateway. So one is installed in Cambodia, one is in Singapore. And when the Atiga Form D is generated and is sent to a single window, is transmitted to the gateway on one country and then it passed to the other country. And this uh, channel is secured, right? Uh, same for the other way around, right? Okay, but there's a little bit of problem here, right? Um, for example, adding any new documents to be exchanged between the governments uh, is a very slow process, right? Um, I have a friend working with the ASEAN Secretariat. Um, he has been working with them for two, three years and trying to, to promote the next document to be exchanged between the governments. And it takes two, three years just to, just to, um, for the governments to agree on what to exchange, what are the fields to exchange, et cetera. Right. So it's a slow process. Um, the other thing is that this G2G, uh, communication, um, doesn't really take into account B2G documents or G2, G2B or even B2B documents, right? So any kind of documents that needs to be exchanged between two parties in two different countries that doesn't involve the government may be left out of this single window, right? So, so that's where, um, VCargo Cloud comes in. We believe that the blockchain, uh, is an ideal solution to be used here, right? So we are working with the, uh, Federation of Thai Industries in Thailand and R3 to implement a cross-border CO exchange uh, is currently in the proof of concept stage. Okay, let me tell you uh, what we are trying to do here. So first of all, um, we, I mean, we have a CODA network and what BCC did was that we created a trade facilitation CODA node, right? And in particular, an ECO core app which resides in the node, okay? So what happened is that when the Federation of Thai Industries approve a CO, in this case, it's a non-preferential CO, right? The CO is then put into the CODA cord, uh, node and, and processed by the core app and sent to the Singapore node, which, which uh, VCC is hosting. And then we will put into the single window, uh, the NTP of Singapore. Okay. Going backwards, um, SICC Singapore uh, Industry uh, International Chamber of Commerce, uh, who is also using a um, product by VCC the, to generate the uh, electronic CO, we will put it into the Coda node and then pass it back to any Thai stakeholders who wants. Uh, who wants to have a copy of the digital CO? Okay, so this currently um, the pilot, I mean, the proof of concept is uh, being carried out from Thailand export uh, the ECO to Singapore NTP. Right, so uh, in this case, why is it in a way um, a solution to what I've said earlier? First of all, it's because it's easy to onboard new. Um, new uh, users, right? They just need to, uh, we just need to establish a new node. Let's say a, a, a bank, right? Wants to participate in a CO exchange or to receive a CO. 
um, the bank will just need to install a node that has the core uh, ECO core app in it, right? And if let's say we want to implement a new document to be exchanged, right? Like a manifest or um, invoice, then we can just create a new core app in that node. So therefore that node can then handle two different documents. So in a way, it is a much faster way for to onboard users. And also it caters for B2B or B2G documents. So um, how we envision the whole thing to work is this, right? Um, let's say uh, from Thailand, the exporter applies for a CO. Uh, this in, in a way, this is the also the Atiga Form D, right? Which is a preferential CO through the Department of Foreign Trade. The CO is sent to the Thai National Single Window, which is then connected to the ASEAN Single Window and sent to the Singapore side, right? Uh, everything is the same here. But now, in addition to that, the exporter, uh, uh, another exporter, I mean, can apply for a non preferential CO with the Federation of Thai Industries and have that CO transmitted into the Singapore NTP as well, right? Um, to be either consumed by Singapore customs or other stakeholders that are connected to NTP. So in a way, we are we we are bridging the the gap that has not been filled by the by the uh, ASEAN single window. And as I mentioned, to add new documents, what we need to do is uh, implement a new core app. Uh, for example, a shipping line has to submit a manifest to customs. Right in, in many countries. So therefore, if you have a new core app with a manifest document, it can be submitted together with a, a CEO from Singapore to the Thai customs. Right. So this is how we envision um, to happen in a in a in a full fledged uh, paperless trade. Okay. So my last slide here. What we have learned so far. Right. Basically, uh, blockchain is well suited for cross border trade because of its characteristics, right? It's trust, the trust that has, that is built into it. But uh, at the same time, uh, establishing document standards is equally important, if not more, right? All this can only happen if there are document standards, which I believe, uh, all the speakers here has already mentioned before, right? So we need to, uh, uh, agree and adhere to a certain standard before implementation can take place. And lastly, uh, we need the legal environment for paperless trade, especially for cross-border uh, paperless trade. Because if one country doesn't recognize the the electronic document, then this will be this all will fall apart, right? So both sides has to be on the on par with this. So uh, that that ends my um, presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Vibun. Uh, so with that, um, we've uh, come to the Q and A part for uh, the webinar. Um, so we'll just go through some of the questions. If you have any questions, there's a Q and A uh, box for you to enter. Um, so let's start with a couple of questions. Uh, I guess the first question would be uh, for uh, Sin Young. So uh, I guess there's a question. Uh, once documents are digitized, uh, is there ability for banks to check documents using digitized documents uh, using existing rules? Uh, is, uh, is this the journey you envisioned uh, during the digitization journey? Um, so maybe I'll pass the question to Sin Young. Uh, I have actually uh, replied this uh, question, answer this question in the Q&A box. So the short oh, answer is yes. The, the short answer okay. is yes. Um, actually, Trade Trust is specifically designed to do this. Excellent. Um, we, we provide um, a, a means uh, for relevant data to be extracted from any document exchange. So of course, uh, we are not, uh, the trust will not look at the AI part, the rule engine part. This, uh, we leave it to the private um, sector because we believe that this is the part 
that each uh, private entity will be able to generate and capture value. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, if you have questions, please free, feel free to add them. Uh, this is another question, maybe both for uh, Kun Kopsak and Sin Yang. Uh, what is the timeline for electronic negotiable title documents? I guess within your respective country. So is there any targets the country has um, that you, they could speak of? Maybe uh, Kun Kopsak, would you um, be able to share any, any, any views on that? Uh, the, the Bank of Thailand is now look consider working on it, and but on the uh, international the uh, the study of the uh, that I mentioned on the, of the ASEAN Business Advisory Council on digital trade connect whereby we have to the two consultant to to work on it right now. We hopefully that the uh, the outcome of the study will be uh, received by end of this year or early next year. Okay, thank you. Uh, for Singapore, we are looking into implementing or incorporating a model law on electronic transferable record in our Singapore's Electronic Transaction Act uh, by second half of next year, which is a 2021. I have also provided uh, this answer in the Q&A box. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, again, if you have questions, feel free to answer them in the Q&A uh, section. Um, I guess there's another question um, for, okay, so this one is uh, generic. So I guess the question is, will banks be disintermediated with the introduction of seamless cross-border paperless trade? Uh, so I was wondering, maybe we can have a uh, baboon. Would, would you wanna try answering that one? This intermediate okay um actually what <laughs> i don't get the uh, meaning of this intermediate actually um okay yeah i guess um yeah well i, I guess the, the question is you know will the role of banks be different in uh in future with paperless trade so i ah, i suspect okay. that that's what the, the, the question is just trying to ask um, okay, um, I I think um, um, moving to uh, paperless trade. Uh, if if we have been following the news uh, in Singapore at least, um, both the major banks, um, OCBC and DBS, um, they have been coming out to say that uh, digitization is the way to go because of um, because of frauds, right? Uh, we we have uh, been hearing about multi million dollar frauds, but there are a lot of small value frauds going on as well. So um, actually, banks are very supportive of the digitization, and I do not think that. Um, uh, and I think that uh, from what we have been working with with the banks in Singapore, they are very supportive and they do see it coming, so they are well prepared. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, then another question, uh, this one is uh, related to TBML. So it says there's a need uh, for review of the current uh, TBML uh, laws as it's still paper centric and needs to keep pace with developments in digital trade. Um, so maybe I can, I can help answer this one because uh, we've been working a little bit about uh, in the TBML space. Um, so I guess, you know, for the, the onus of TBML has primarily fallen on financial institutions. Um, and you know, it was really up to each bank to implement their own controls um, and processes and systems. Uh, what's interesting now is that as we're moving to paperless trade, we're seeing more of a consortium approach to tackling TBML. So actually there was a webinar just recently by one of the, the leading uh, AML providers, Nice Actimize, and they they talked about the, the way of uh, tackling TBML through a consortium approach and then being able to uh, use data, uh, trusted data, uh, to help facilitate that. And so I think 
if anything, um, it, the use of emerging technologies, the fact that we're moving to more towards paperless trade uh, enables banks to potentially have more access to data and potentially mutualize the costs within within a group. Uh, so it's it's still uh, quite early days, but you know the, the sense that we're getting is that you know, banks can't tackle it on their own, and th there's new initiatives um, looking to, to to try to solve that. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, let me see if there's some other ones. Uh, so another question. Uh, let me see. Because there's a question around uh, pa you know, paper and digital documents coexisting. So this is after the release of law uh, of no digital docs, how long do you think that paper documents will coexist with digital ones? Uh, so maybe uh, pass it to Sin Young if you had any initial thoughts on that. Sorry, uh, which question are you referring to? Because I can't find uh, this question. Uh, this is question number 13. Okay. Oh, in, in, in my view, uh, I think uh, both medium will coexist for a long time, at least for another 10 years easily, because uh, for a simple reason, old habit die hard. So that is the reason why uh, we look at uh, interoperability, even across different medium means uh, you can easily convert digital to paper and paper back to digital not by pdf scanning but uh, more for the downstream uh, recipient to be able to extract data from the document that they receive okay thank you um we probably have time for maybe a couple more questions so Again, if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat channel. Um, let me see. There's a question here, it's question number 14. Uh, enforceability is still the main issue, notwithstanding steps taken for uh, the prevention of fraud. Um, what are the initiatives taken to ensure the enforceability of documents? Should this be a government initiative? Um, so I'm not sure if any of the panelists had a, a view on that that they'd like to share. This is question number 14. Okay. Um, Uh, actually, I don't yeah. understand the question. Yeah. It, yeah, it's a bit. Uh, yeah, I think it's what what steps are, what are maybe what are the solutions that governments or or governments or private organizations are helping to prevent uh, fraud uh, within uh, these solutions. That's that's what I believe the, the question was. Um, okay, actually, um, in, in Singapore, we also look, uh, uh, in my area of work, I actually look into this uh, fraud uh, quite uh, in detail. I think in the first place, uh, we need to be very certain that um, uh, there's a difference between fraud as well as uh, loopholes. So, um, if let's say a bad guy really want to cheat someone out of his money, uh, I think there's a limit as to how uh, technology can solve because I don't think technology will be able to prevent fraud 100% of the time. Of course, it will make uh, technology, what can technology do is to make the, the, uh, the raise the level of difficulty in committing fraud. But I think the more useful area is how can technology to uh, actually help to cover loopholes that um, um, businesses can actually capitalize on it uh, in a legal way. Okay, thank you. Uh, this um, is my view. Yeah. 
Thank you for that. Um, I guess there's another question, question eight. So banks are in SWIFT and that has been there uh, since the 70s. And how will this ecosystem evolve? Do you see this replacing SWIFT? So maybe I can I can, I can help answer that one. So I think um, the SWIFT is, still plays a very important function, uh, especially in trade and payments. And um, we don't see them being replaced. Uh, I think they're, you know, the, you know, in our conversations with them, it seems uh, they're quite open to collaborating uh, and um, integrating with different solutions. So as an example, R3 and Swift, we collaborated in uh, uh, integrating their payments or Swift GPI solution with Corda. Um, and so it's likely that many of these existing solutions or networks would you know enable interoperability uh, and so we don't imagine that you know if they would replace it'd be more um more of a partner if anything uh, given their role and importance in trade um i, I believe that's all the, the time we have i think we've uh, we've reached the top of the hour so i guess with that i'll pass the time to uh stacy to to wrap up Well, I don't know about everybody else, but I found it enlightening. Um, I wish we could have had more time because there are so many more questions. I want to thank all of our panelists for the devoted time they spent with us tonight or this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are. And of course, thank you. A uh, big shout out to R3 um, for sponsoring and co-hosting the event with BAF. Um, I would like to let you know that the um, the recordings will be available on the BAF website, I believe, next week. Um, so please let your teams know that they can actually um, listen also to the full webinars. Thank you very much, and have a good day. <laughs>